Welcome back to Conservation Conversations with me, your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureSurf. As 2023 comes to an end, we're celebrating another year of inspiring discussions with podcast guests devoted to protecting biodiversity. As in past years, NatureSurf's communications team has assembled snippets from the conversations that resonated most deeply with them. So keep listening to hear some of our favorite clips from scientists and conservation professionals who work tirelessly to safeguard our plants, animals, and ecosystems. In this month's special episode, we celebrate our deep connection to biodiversity and our reliance on the services it provides. We'll hear about how the delicate balance of nature is under threat and how restoring that balance hinges on our ability to prioritize solutions that include everyone, from researchers and policymakers to community members, and especially the all too often underrepresented perspectives. We'll also chat about three of our biggest tools in our conservation toolkit, promoting inclusivity in the natural world, funding key legislation, and harnessing the power of biodiversity data. We're grateful to all of those who have contributed to this podcast by sharing their stories of adventure, success, failure, and hope. Going into the new year, we hope that you feel as optimistic as we do about our ability to work together to conserve the world we love. A theme central to many of this year's podcast guests is the realization that the world is much larger than just us humans. We have an enormous impact on nature, yet we are such a small part of the web of life that we depend on to live well. We'll hear first from author and biologist, Dr. Caroline Van Hemert, who, while on an epic expedition, drew inspiration from the wildlife that traveled alongside her on their own migratory journeys. Also note, Caroline is a modern day biologist and adventurer, and you should really read her book, The Sun is a Compass. Probably the biggest theme, not only in the book, but really of my um, experience and Pat's experience on, on the trip is just this, this sense of being kind of one of this massive, you know, migration taking place. And that sort of wondrous fact of, of nature of these, these birds that do these really remarkable things that we kind of take for granted, you know, you, springtime comes, you see all these birds show up and it's like, oh, uh, I guess the birds are, uh, arriving, but, you know, we don't often think about where, how far they've come, all of the sort of trials and tribulations that they've had to deal with along the way. And so that part of it as an ornithologist, it was just really quite fantastic to see them making their way. And also the caribou were also really important, particularly when we got to the Arctic um, for lots of reasons. I mean, just because it's amazing to be in the company of caribou, no matter where you are. Um, but we came to rely on them really heavily uh, in terms of route finding. So I mentioned, you know, meeting people and having them explain, like, this is how I would travel if you're going this direction. Um, but when it really came down to, like, feet on the ground, uh, you know, paddling down a river, we were always looking for the caribou to be our guides because they knew best and they, they've known best for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, there were a handful of times where we're like, ah, this doesn't look quite like the crossing we want to make. It's a little deep. It's a little cold. We'll just stay on this side of the river. And sure enough, it was the wrong side. Um, and we would find that out in usually quite dramatic ways. You know, you get to this sheer cliff and it's clear that you're not going anywhere or, um, yeah, just get into this real wallow of thick brush because there wasn't a caribou trail and that was not the right way to go. So I think we kind of came to rely on the caribou wisdom. And, and I think that that bodily sense of shifting away from your own intuition and sort of trusting the natural world and trusting these creatures that, that don't have, you know, what we would consider like the same sort of intelligence that we, we do necessarily, but they have a very, very deep um, sense of, of knowledge and uh, intelligence that leaning into that was, was a really neat experience. One thing that really resonated with me during my chat with Caroline was when she noted that the world is changing so fast, but that we need to remain hopeful and not give up. The idea of remaining hopeful and inspiring hopefulness by staying curious was also something expressed by one of our other guests this year, Rachel Tancock, the face and force behind The Nature Educator on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Be sure to follow Rachel on social media for positive, energetic, inspirational, natural moments. 
that's my biggest goal with my account is to get people to just connect more to the plants, the animals, the ecosystems around them. And in turn, like from that, they will build more pro-environmental behaviors. They will care more about nature. They'll want to protect lands from development and all these things. One of my biggest things that I try to encourage people, stay curious, like just stay curious all the time. Um, We will never know everything. Even an expert in a very specific field, they know a lot, but they I mean, they're re- if they're researching, they don't know everything yet. So, and with things always changing, there's always something new to learn. So I just, I always encourage people to just stay curious. And there's some topics that can seem extremely inaccessible for people because of that academia side of thing. And just keep learning, reach out to people in your community. There's so many different naturalist groups and, you know, different communities that you can become a part of. and you can just never stop. You'll never know everything. Just keep yeah. learning all the time. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to not know the answers to things. It's just an opportunity for us to come together and just keep learning. A big takeaway this season is that those of us who love nature, and of course, who doesn't, have a responsibility to ensure that all people have a sense of belonging and welcomeness in nature and to increase access and opportunity for minoritized groups to be a part of the conversation and conservation efforts. This idea was emphasized by Dudley Edmondson, a wildlife photographer, filmmaker, and author. Dudley summed it up nicely when he said, I belong where I choose to be. You know, my philosophy has always been, I belong where I choose to be. And that is something I've lived by most of my adult life. I think that it's important for up and coming uh, populations and groups of people to feel that sense of ownership about public lands or indigenous lands. In order for people to be good stewards, they have to have a connection to those spaces, a sense of ownership and feeling um, as though, you know, they're they're part of, of who they are. And uh, th- those are things I think that oftentimes with, within white families, those things get passed down over generations. And I think that uh, for families of color, those are traditions that w- we will have to continue in order to be able to uh, be able to appreciate uh, those those spaces. Among other topics, Dudley spoke with me about gaining hope for the future by viewing it through the eyes of younger generations. This idea continued to come up in other conversations here on the podcast, including with Priya Nanjapa, the Vice President for Conservation Programs at the National Parks Conservation Association. Priya shined a light on how different cultures and experiences influence our relationship with nature. I've actually spoken about this um, as it relates to amphibians and reptiles as kind of the marginalized creatures in the wildlife world and um, how the we know as biologists that the health of an ecosystem is much stronger when there is a diversity of structures of um sources of food of you know of predator prey interactions you know all of those things create a, a highly functioning ecosystem and in the same way with people that diversity of thought of experience of perspective um of of lived experience of, of background of of knowledges um cultural knowledges those are what enrich our um professional ecosystem and i think you know we're making good strides and and there's a lot of just kind of as the time has passed you know students that are coming into the natural resources um uh world and and degrees and and experiences you know there's a lot more efforts of inclusion and equity even among those groups um you know who bear those identities themselves and i think that's what's really fantastic is less the movements of you know folks trying to bring in the people of color but rather the people of color themselves reclaiming those spaces and Mm -hmm. and their um opportunities to be there and and i think that's what's um really exciting and really hopeful, you know, for the future. But there's there's definitely a lot of work um, that we need to continue to do, especially in the conservation space, 
I really appreciated how Priya spoke about the benefits of biological diversity in the conservation movement and how it mirrors the benefits of diversity in our own communities of people stewarding that movement. We're all connected, not only to each other and to all other species, but also to the land, water, and other resources we rely on and call home. Dr. Catherine Febria, Canada Research Chair and Assistant Professor in Freshwater Restoration and Ecology at the University of Windsor in Canada, really brought this connection home. Catherine spoke about her experiences conducting ethical science alongside Indigenous communities in New Zealand where the importance of a river to indigenous cultures and people was acknowledged by granting the river personhood status. You know, when I first landed in New Zealand, for example, I would spend a lot of time working with farmers. Like it, on the surface, what do we have in common? You know, I, you know, I'm an immigrant to Canada and transplanted um, to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and like didn't know anything about dairy farming. But I think you know, it's it was really important because they are stewarding headwaters, the wet agricultural wetlands and urban wetlands and small drains that are buried. And it was really about trying to find ways to relate to one another and trying to find a common ground for understanding. And they had so much knowledge. You know, we would talk to them about rain patterns and, you know, certain plant relationships. And they would say, you know, they had such precision in their memory around that. And we would want to engage that in that in, in, in our experiment. And, and likewise, when we work with indigenous communities, um, and that knowledge, it is really about um, my our approach in the lab is really like I don't go anywhere. We're, we're not invited like we aren't trying to um, extract information, but really by fostering a space and listening for the ways in which science can help. Then that is kind of, you know, we, we go to community and offer the services that are that are of interest. Um, and so it is really thinking about building the relationships first. Um, so the tool of like a legal tool, like personhood status was certainly driven by communities. And I think, you know, in the in North Island, I wasn't, you know, it was driven by local indigenous communities wanting to really recognize that rivers are living things and uh, a, a relation and someone, to, something that has, uh, that deserves protection. And, and I do see it kind of translating into these conversations globally around how can we reframe our relationship to nature? Um, and so that's kind of the way that I think about it. Um, my T-shirt at the moment says like river doctor, <laughs> what a student made it for me. Um, and it was really thinking about how do we as science, I mean, that's how it looks like in action is how do we as scientists use the, the school skills and the tools to, you know, reconnect rivers to their landscapes and people to their landscapes. So far, we've heard a bit about the importance of being intentionally inclusive and engaging when rallying for biodiversity. Another one of our key conservation tools is effective legislation. Next up, we'll hear from author and attorney Lowell Bear as he talks about some of the challenges we face when rallying support, both in terms of engaging the public and advocating for more funding to keep conservation legislation afloat. My hope is bound up with my greatest frustration today, and that is getting the attention of the American public to the biodiversity crisis and how it's affected by climate change and the role that the ESA plays in um, that dynamic. It, there are three factors that all work together. How do you how do you um, get the American the average American public uh, to to listen and understand that, and then begin to become proactive? in their lives because they're, they're, they're flooded with uh, media, with false information, with elections, with keeping their job, they're starting school for the kids, uh, their mortgages, uh, will they have a job tomorrow, et cetera. They're so, uh, life is so complicated today. And to get through, to get through for the American public to understand the crisis like you and I and others in our world do uh, is my biggest frustration. Mm -hmm. But my hope is that I and others, by constantly being on the stump and have and being in, in, in involved in talking to the public, will finally get their attention. Lowell hit on something we've already heard in this episode, the importance of using your voice to talk about biodiversity and the importance of conservation. Our next guest reminds us that we need to speak up not only about key conservation issues, but about misconceptions. 
Dr. Winifred Frick, the chief scientist at Bat Conservation International, touches on this when talking about the many services that bats provide. So bats that you might see in your backyard are uh, eating all sorts of nocturnal flying insects, moths, and um, and they do eat some mosquitoes, um, which we always like to thank them for. Um, and and then around the world, though, the diet of bats gets more more variable. So in tropical areas, there's lots of different pollinating species of bats that pollinate um, all sorts of plants, including commercially important plants like durian in Asia. Durian is a really favorite food uh, in Asia, um, and bats are the prime pollinator for that. Um, in Mexico, bats are important pollinators of columnar cactus. So, um, you know, the big iconic cactus, saguaro cactus and in Arizona um, is pollinated by bats. And then bats are also the the pollinators of agave. Um, and of got, agave, of course, is the plant that we harvest for tequila. So we actually harvest agaves before they flower, but without bats, we wouldn't have agave plants. And so we always say, if you know, you're know you enjoying your margarita, toast a bat. So uh, we've lost over 90% of three species uh, over the um, past 15 years or so because of the disease of white nose syndrome. Bats need advocates and friends and enthusiasts, um, like a lot of nature. And um, people often ask, like, what can they what can they do to help? And there's, um, you know, uh, anything that you do to uh, lower your carbon footprint, anything you do to um, contribute to uh, a healthier planet helps bats because they share the planet with us. Um, and uh, yeah, tell tell your friends and, and family how cool bats are. During the final few segments of this end of year episode, we turn to the importance of biodiversity data to informing conservation decisions. Dr. Kirk Johnson, SANT Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, talks about how we can only make positive change in the future if we continue to learn from our past while embracing cutting edge technology. It's just because biodiversity is so complicated, but we've got some new tools. I mean, that's the amazing thing is we've, um, you look back at how museums used to sample biodiversity and how they do it now, we used to go out and collect Organisms. And we still do that. We collect all sorts of different um, samples from the natural world. But with the discovery and uh, development in the arenas of DNA, we now have this tool called environmental DNA, where we can take a, a glass of water out of the Potomac River and get the DNA out of that water and tell you which fish were swimming by. That's a that's a tool we're going to see developing over the next couple of decades that will rapidly accelerate our understanding of of uh, the how nature is and um it's it's been great to watch these new developments come online one after another and uh, give us tools we never imagined really i mean museums were all founded long before we knew that dna existed i mean that was only 1953 right when the dna right. was discovered so um you know think of the depression so these people in the 1880s started collecting things because they knew we would need this information in the future. And right. for that reason, we at the museums continue to collect things now because we know that people in the year 2100 are going to want to know what was happening in the year 2030. Right. So it's like we are, we are the forever place of our society. Today, we have a lot going for us in terms of our capacity to understand how the natural world operates and what it needs to thrive. We have hard scientific data we can analyze to ask key questions in the conservation of biodiversity. What is out there, where is it, and how is biodiversity doing? The answers to these questions, the absolutely foundational questions for conservation planning, are the very questions that NatureServe answers. Last up, NatureServe's very own Regan Smythe, our Vice President for Data and Methods, tells us about the current state of biodiversity in the United States referencing the results of NatureServe's 2023 Biodiversity in Focus report. The numbers are, are pretty shattering. So 34% of plants, 40% of animals are at risk of extinction, and 41% of ecosystems are at risk of collapse. Okay, it might be at risk, but if it's all protected, you know, maybe it's okay, versus if it's not protected, we really have a problem. And what we saw there was by and large for both species and ecosystems, we're not, we're not hitting the levels of protection that we really need to continue to sustain this diversity of life. So, to me, it like hurts my soul to know all these 
amazing critters and plants that have evolved over millions and millions, millions of years, we're losing them at astonishing rates. Yeah. But it also, you know, threatens the future of, of mankind as well. And I think it's great that people are talking about biodiversity now. Um, it's important we're having this conversation, but there really is an urgency to act. We are in a moment of crisis and, and we shouldn't be making light of that. Yeah. But being able to drill down and ask, you know, what's the, the overall statistic on how biodiversity is doing? But the knowledge beneath that, the knowing that freshwater mussels are particularly imperiled, knowing that those are the species that have this important role providing ecosystem services and cleaning our waters and streams, we now have the information that kind of helps us know where our conservation dollars should be going. I invite you to visit our website, www.natureserve.org, to read more about the challenges facing biodiversity in the United States and across the entire planet. While there is dire news, there is always room for hope. And I think we have demonstrated that with this month's program. Thank you so much for tuning in to this special Best of 2023 episode. We hope that these moments have inspired you and demonstrated the value of conserving the fascinating biodiversity that surrounds us. As always, we're extraordinarily thankful for all of our listeners and for your feedback, which is always valued and appreciated. If you have any suggestions for topics or guests you think should be on future episodes, please shoot us an email at info at natureserve.org. And as you know, because you're listening, you can find Conservation Conversations on all the major podcast platforms, and we would love for you to review the show. Positive reviews are really helpful to us getting the word out about biodiversity. And before I wrap up this season of Conservation Conversations and another wonderful year at NatureServe, I want to thank all of our guests again, as well as the team at NatureServe that makes the show possible. Samantha Belilti, Allison Kenlin, and Jacqueline Alperdi, really you are wonders, and I thank you. Finally, I want to remind you to please consider supporting our mission with a contribution to NatureServe. Everything we share with the public, from educational podcast episodes to insightful reports and other work we do, is funded through donations from listeners like you. Your support provides the protection biodiversity needs to thrive. Please visit us online at natureserve.org slash ways to give to explore the different giving opportunities and commit your support today. Together, we can make a difference for the vulnerable plants and animals and ecosystems in North America. Thank you, and we'll see you again in the next episode of Conservation Conversations. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening.